Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our guest today is an absolute juggernaut of music production. He is Dave Auday. He's a rare example of when technical prowess meets a tremendous gift of an ear developed over years of dedication to rocking a crowd and allows for complete expression. He's a songwriter and a producer, but he's truly made his bones taking the compositions of some of, maybe even most of, the most relevant artists and reconstructing them to crush the dance floor. He's got 133 Billboard number 1 dance tracks, far more than anyone else, and that number will probably be obsolete by the time you hear this episode. We're talking about artists to include U2, Coldplay, Madonna, Lady Gaga, Katy Perry, Ariana Grande, Mark Ronson, Bruno Mars, Erasure, One Republic, Rihanna, Jennifer Lopez, Selena Gomez, Chris Brown, Kelly Clarkson, Britney Spears, The Pussycat Dolls, Beyonce, Donna Summer, Korn. Man, who's got time? Anyway, he's collaborated with Sting before, and he's got six tracks on Sting's new album, He's also a devoted dad and a great dude, and he's our guest today. He's Dave Auday. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This is East. Sebastian Yoder. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> What's up? It's Dave Day, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yes, indeed. Dave Day is a songwriter, a producer, and I'll proclaim it here, the world's greatest remixer. I guess I'm not the only one who thinks so, though. Dave has... Last count I saw was 133 number one songs on the Billboard Dance Club songs chart. And that's more than anyone else. And you seem to keep racking them up like a gas pump. Uh, his new collaboration is with Sting. He produced six songs on Sting's new album called My Songs and their updates of Sting's classics for 2020. Dave, we're big fans. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Is that 133 number accurate? Or have you done something in the last couple of weeks to make it even higher? Oh, that's funny. Um, no, that's that's. I think right now that's where we're at. I mean, I've. I'm still doing a lot of remixing, a lot of producing, a lot of songwriting. But I mean, I, you know, 10 years ago, I think I was really knocking out a lot of remixes. And I think in 2009, 2010, each one of those years, I had 18 or 19 number ones each year. So which is a lot. But I yeah, it's 133 is pretty good. Pretty good. I don't I don't not really cons I'm not really I've never tried to get to that number, period. So the fact that I'm there is, you know, kind of crazy. So just so our listeners can have some context, right? I'd like to uh, I'd like to rewind because your remixing career has. We were trying to we started to make a list of all the artists you've worked with, and then Pete figured that it'd be easier to make a list of the artists you haven't worked with. And uh, uh, yeah. we really just made a list of dead people. That's, that's <laughs> hilarious. If we made a list, you know, it's funny because a lot of times I will. Uh, tell people what I haven't remixed uh, rather than what I have remixed because they're, they're it's actually kind of easier. Like Whitney Houston. Right. Right. I never did Bad. a Whitney Houston song. Right. And Prince. Um, Didn't Prince. see Frank Sinatra. I haven't done a Prince song. Frank Sinatra. Yeah. So Elvis. I haven't done an Elvis song. <laughs> However, Tammy Wynette. Tammy Wynette. Uh, no. No. That's not true. Is that not yours? I did Tammy Wynette. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Yes. Also yeah. dead, but you did do it. So that's not even true that dead people are, are uh, immune. No, I have worked on some dead people. And I've also worked on some people that might seem dead, even though they're actually living. I heard a uh, Fleetwood Mac uh, remix. You know, that's so funny because Tammy Wynette's estate reached out to me. That was pretty incredible. Um, because it was obviously a huge, a huge song. Uh, the Fleetwood Mac thing you just mentioned. Crazy enough, I don't even think that came out. Somehow that got sent to the label, which at the time probably still is. It's Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. And somebody at the label leaked the song. Oh, huh. That, that, that never even came out. Wow. So were you ever actually hired by Warner Brothers? Or did you do that one on spec? No, I actually did that. I got paid to do it. Uh, they were doing this 
album of uh, remixes. This is like probably 14 years ago, 15 years ago. So not wow. recently. And I forgot the guy's name, but he was he was doing, you know, he was taking all these, he was getting Warners to give him all these old multis on all these classic songs. And Fleetwood Mac was one of them. And I just don't think uh, the band wanted to put anything out. This is like before remixing was like, sort of like a thing. Um, and this guy was kind of ahead of the curve, getting the multis and trying to trying to make all this crazy, re these crazy remixes happen. And I, I don't think the band was into it or I don't even know, but yeah. uh, it just never, it never came out, but somebody at the label <laughs> liked it. So they leaked, I don't even think, it, I'm not sure if it was even mixed or not, but it got leaked and I get asked people this, I get a lot of crazy fans that ask me to send them, you know, wave files i don't know why i have all these fans that want wave files it's this weird thing going on hmm. hey i want to figure out because your your musical ideas are incredible you know you talk about taking the great things that are in a song when you remix it and then just kind of putting your own things in there how do you fill your well because there's there's just so much stuff out there and it's it's so varied in how you do it and i mean from rihanna to celine dion you're just doing slightly different things all the time. Where does that come from? You know, honestly, I don't know. Um, I've been, I've just been doing this. I've been kind of making music so long and, and especially the remix thing, which, you know, my career was sort of born with remixing, like remixing kind of got big as my career sort of started. So it just happens that I was there when that sort of was, was born. Well, let's unpack that a little bit though. Where were you born? Where was I born? I was born in Van Nuys, California. Van Nuys. So you grew, and did you spend your formative years in, in the Los Angeles area? I spent my entire life in L.A. until one year ago. Wow. So the thing about growing up in L.A. for our listeners elsewhere is I grew up in the Bay Area, but spent a lot of time in L.A., summers in L.A. And, and uh, in L.A., you hear everything. Everything. Yeah. So you yeah. can point to a number of musical influence. So, so that begs the question, how did you come up musically? What were you listening to? What were your, your peers listening to? Do you have older cousins who were from Long Beach or what, how did that all evolve? These are, that's some, some weird, weird stuff you came up with there. I love that. <laughs> <All> the cousins. <laughs> uh, I, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I think like a lot of kids uh, my age was listening to the radio. I yeah. had a little radio at the dinner table. And this is the crazy thing is I used to just literally, it would be so loud, so low and level that I just put my ear next to the speaker. This is like before headphones or, or anything really. It's like a little, it was a little transistor radio thing just with, at the end of the, at the end of the table. And I would just sit there and listen to Rick D's, countdown which is i know it's crazy to mention rick d's but i just remember it was and i became good funny enough i became very good friends with rick d's later late in later years through his son kevin d's awesome so it's kind of cool i've had a few full circle moments in my life that's one of them working with olivia newton john's another one of them uh working on john lennon stuff's another one of those full circle things my favorite band growing up was a band called erasure sure all right about Nine years ago, I started working with Andy Bell, the lead singer of Erasure. They played and at I, the Wiltern this past uh, this past year, and man, those guys are packed with songs. I was actually texting John when we were at the show, and I'm like, if, if I told you that Erasure had ten albums, would it surprise you? And he's like, Fuck yeah, it surprised me. Like they've got over fifteen. Yeah, they got more than that. I was gonna say, yeah, they've yeah, got yeah. a lot of albums. Uh, they've been going forever, and you know, Vince Clark. You know, Andy Bell is a voice of erasure. So, you know, he's, you know, phenomenal. But really, Vince Clark, for a kid, for a keyboard player, for a synthesizer player growing up in the San Fernando Valley, uh, meeting Vince Clark and, and uh, 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 listening to Vince Clark was, was huge because of, you know, obviously Depeche Mode and Yaz. Right. And Erasure. So that was a, he was a big influence on me, for sure. Wow. Now, a lot of our listeners are going to be uninitiated to the nuances of the remix world, and I want to just get everybody to take a listen. Go to YouTube and look up Dave Audet, and 
don't just listen to the remixes, but maybe go to, I think you did a, rep, a webinar for somebody that was really interesting. And for our audio files in the audience, go check that out because it really gave you a chance to deconstruct your process. And for everybody who's not familiar with the nuances of what it takes to do a remix, uh, you really explained it wonderfully in this webinar. And I think that in order to break it down uh, for for people who are not familiar with sitting behind the console, it's really taking somebody's songs, pulling them completely apart, and then rebuilding them in a way that has a purpose. And in your case, that purpose a lot of times is to put and move butts on the dance floor. So let's talk about what you did with Sting. You did six songs on Sting's yeah, new album. So Sting, did six songs on Sting's new album. I know it's like a dream come true. It's kind of like I'm uh, living some weird reality thing. Yeah, and, wow. Uh, you know, I I met Sting through through remixing. I remixed uh, a song for him uh, in 2003. I remixed uh, "Send Your Love," which was off his Sacred Love album. Right. At the time, um, the guy who was a and ring everything was Martin Kirzemom, who's now managing me. And uh, Martin loved the remix so much and Sting loved the remix so much. They added it onto the end of the Sacred Love album. So uh, that was the first time I had been remixing then for about, I don't know, seven or eight, seven or eight years. And to have one of my remixes get put on an album, that was pretty cool. And then he was doing my version live in his in his in his uh, live show. That's fantastic. And that was uh, 2003 ish, somewhere around there. And that was when I first met Sting. So I've, I've, you know, obviously anybody who's followed Sting's career uh, over the past, you know, 15, 16 years knows kind of what he's been doing or what he hasn't been doing. And he sort of really decided uh, a couple years ago, three years ago, to to get back into pop music. Here we are with the new album. December of last year, they, they called me and said, Sting's going to be playing in Times Square on New Year's Eve on TV, on the Steve Harvey show, uh, New Year's Eve thing. And he, he wants to redo, he wants to sing Brand New Day, but he needs a new version of it. So that was kind of how this whole My Songs thing started, is I redid that song. In December. So no pressure. Nope. Well, to, I, I just redo a Sting weeks. song. <laughs> I had about yeah. two weeks to do, to do it. They sent me all the all the... The original stems and um, native tracks. Yeah, I just sort of, you know, I didn't, I didn't. There's, there's different ways to remix things. I didn't just want to, you know, kill the song. I wanted just to sort of take it into 2019. Sting loved it, and he performed it on on TV, and it worked out really well. Even though it was playing pouring rain when he um, performed it on TV. That's the best time to perform, though, right? That's like the the great Prince oh, it story. Oh, looks cool. Yeah, yeah, playing Purple Rain in the rain at the Super Bowl. Come on, exactly, yeah. exactly. It's it looked he looked totally. I mean, he's Sting, by the way. Sting could pretty much do anything. Yeah, he's gonna look cool. Um, how do you know like, what brings something into 2019? Though, I mean, how do you keep your ear fresh? Because there is a sense to it. You know, you, we just got back from Bottle Rock. We did some work there, and you hear the bands that play older stuff or new bands that play. Other people, like it was one band that they sounded like a really good cover band that played original music. They sounded like everybody else. You're not doing that, though. You're getting to a different spot, and you're able to clearly keep your finger on the pulse. Where does that come from? Probably from DJing. Um, I've been DJing for you know 25 years. Yeah. I'm still, I'm still playing about eh, 12, 12 shows a year. Not a lot. The city of Nashville found out I'm here, um, so now I'm playing like every – Nashville. I played New Year's Eve. It was like me. I was DJing, and it was Peter Frampton and Keith Urban down in front of uh, City Hall downtown. July Fourth, I'm playing down on the river with the fireworks going off, and a couple, there's like three or four bands playing. So, but de- just DJing for 25 years and remixing, both sort of in together, has really just helped help me sort of stay uh, keep my ear to the ground. You know the thing about DJing is you cannot deny what works. Huh. And so when something is happening, you know that it's happening and you know. So, you know, to Pete's point, w- what keeps your ear fresh and your finger on the pulse 
well, you, you have to make the butts move. And when yeah. you see the butts move, you know it's working. I've cleared many floors. Well, that's what it takes. <laughs> so that's really the, the the short answer is I've cleared enough floors to know that, um, you know, certain things, certain it's things, not that yeah. and certain things don't work. You know, my, my, I just want to get the girls on the dance floor. That's my, that's my sole goal uh, starting out. And the, I guess it's turned into, I want my wife to, to, to dance, I guess. Have fun. Yeah. I mean, there's really the DJ has, there's three things that the DJ does that, that make them successful. And that is that the, the bar gets to sell drinks. The girls yep. get to sing along and dance and the guys get to take the girls home. Yeah. And if you can help those three things happen, there's nothing more that gets your finger on the pulse. And so now you can take that and translate it into somebody's remix and bring it to today. How true is that? Yeah, it's, it's true, man. I fell in love with club culture years ago and and that's kind of what really got me into um club culture really got me into the music business i w- i didn't know what i was going to do before club culture i thought i was going to be a keyboard player in journey or something the the clubs was a way for me to sort of get into the music business a way in and uh, i'm very lucky to 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 still be doing it i want to go back a little further into your your formative years because obviously your brother played professional baseball that means yep. you guys were, were throwing the ball back and forth as hard as you can at each other, but yep. you're a keyboard player. Yeah. Was it always that you were going to be the musician or did, did his talent just like, I don't know. How did that work out? Because you guys are both elite performers in your professions, but your professions are dramatically different. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, if you, he could probably guess, I mean, I was the, I was the 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 kid playing the synthesizers in the bedroom and p- performing at school and doing concerts. And I, when I was in high school, I was playing ro- the Roxy and Whiskey on Sunset Boulevard. So, wow. you know, it was pretty cool. I mean, I wasn't like having success, but I was playing these venues. You know, my my parents thought it was funny and you know cool. Uh, but then all of a sudden, my little brother, who's two years younger than me, um, gets into uh, the end of his senior year in high school, you know, gets drafted second round of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Yeah. And so then everything basically, you know, went from Dave to my brother, Rich. And then that lasted for about uh, a decade um, <laughs> until, and my, cause my parents, you know, look, you know, DJing, remixing, producing, it's not really something most parents can get into understand yeah that's not know, a comfortable what, path for a parent yeah it's not something that they just can explain to their friends and you know and their friends are going to understand but they say hey my son's a baseball player that's pretty easy to understand mm-hmm. and he hit a home run at dodger stadium like his first home run against the dodgers which also is pretty cool and yeah and easy to understand it is easy to explain my my son plays for the pirates yeah it's very american but my son you know, uh, playing a, a Roland JX three piece synthesizer uh, <laughs> doesn't really translate as well, does it? No, not so much. My son hit a home run versus yeah. My son got a new plug in endorsement deal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A little like, different. You know, my parents look. Uh, I I don't even know if my parents really fully grasp what I do still. Just be, it's just a generation thing, you know. Sure. They they know I have a Grammy, so I think they probably tell everybody I have a Grammy. That, that sort of legitimizes you. Yeah, I mean, it's just something. Again, it's something that they can say to their friends that their friends are going to go, "Oh, I've heard of that. I know what a Grammy is." I mean, they they everybody all, but everybody also thinks there's ten old guys with beards that sit around a table to decide who gets Grammys. So, you know, but at least it's something that tangible that that they can. They can tell their friends. So, if a Grammy legitimizes you in front of your parents, in front of your parents' friends, yeah, what did it do for you in your actual career from a day to day basis? Did did it make the phone ring more, or or was your phone ringing to capacity already anyway? Um, it might have made it ring less. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> no, because look, you know. Uh, I, you know, winning a Grammy is awesome. You're not underground anymore. No, no, exactly. I'm not under, and I also won for a song that was like not underground. It was like the most p- popular song in the last decade. You know, Uptown Funk. Yeah, I mean, it won Song of the Year, but it was definitely the <laughs> Song of the Year, not in quotation marks, because 
everywhere you went, it was playing. Everywhere. Yeah. And so I, you know, and I had, look, I won a Grammy for a song that was like the ridiculously huge. And I'd also done a million remixes. So you put those two things together and there's the Grammy for, for best remix recording. Yeah. Um, it doesn't, I don't know if my phone rang more. I just think when uh, people hired me that they, that they knew that, that, you know, they were hiring somebody that was for sure going to give them something uh, of quality, I think. So does that mean the price goes up? Honestly, the price, I don't think that happens. I mean, I, I, I guess I I think I pretty, I think I thought that was going to happen. I I can honestly say, I I think the price just is what it is. I don't think it's gone up. It's just, You know, it's just uh, maybe I'm taking less projects. I mean, and not taking every project now and thinking about it more. I don't know. I, you know, I just love producing records, regardless of you know uh, uh, how big the artist is, how small the artist is, how big the song is, how small the song is. I worked on some, some, some bad songs. I worked on some great songs. I just love what I do, and I and I love waking up every day and doing. It. And I'm 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 not bored of it yet. Um, I love, I love remixing, but I love producing. It's, I'm, I'm really excited that I'm, I'm making this pivot in my career. You know, I've re yeah. I've remixed everybody. So, uh, but that's not why I'm pivoting. I've always been a producer, you know, remixing is producing. Yeah. And it's very, yeah. it's very important. People right. understand the only difference is when you're remixing, you're kind of a starting point or support as opposed to producing. Sometimes you're producing, or a lot of times you're producing from the, from the beginning, from the ground up. Let me ask you a little bit about your work process then, too, because this is interesting to me. You've got these projects. There's there's likely several projects on your desk at one time, and I was listening to you talk on another interview. You know, do you sit down and just hammer away at one song <laughs> for 15 hours straight? Or do you – because you seem like a work-life balance yeah. guy, but you got kids, you know? So how, how do you – how do you stay on task, but also, and then the, other, the secondary question I want you to answer is when you get music from somebody, whether it's Sting or Fergie, do you go, holy shit, I really got to get this right? I mean, obviously you always do a great job, but do you feel pressure from any particular artist because of, of you know, not being starstruck, but just, you know, it's know. fucking Sting. I, you know? I said the same thing to my wife. It's fucking Sting. <laughs> I know. You know, it's, it's, uh, <sighs> I, I again, I it, I've had I've asked this same question so many times, and everybody wants me to give them like this crazy, methodical like solution that they can input into their daily life so they can like you know have success, and I think part of the success is not thinking about it too much for me, and I think I don't think that's super deep or anything, but I take lots of breaks uh, during the day. And there are lots of short breaks. I, I jump up and I go see what my kids are doing or I, you know, get something to drink. I, I'm not sitting here for 18 hours. I did that in the early part of my career. And I, I'm sure anybody who makes music probably remembers the, the, the first 10 years of your career. You're like literally sitting in a dark room, just jamming away over and over nonstop. You know, your ears are bleeding when you're going to bed every night. And I did that for a long time back when you know, you were using an analog desk and you were using, you know, a Kai samplers to load all your vocals into. And you can, you, you know, which means you were working on one song a day or a one song a week. Right. So the process yeah. for me is so incredible now that I can work on, you know, 15 songs in one day if I, if I want to. And that's really helped me and I love that I'm able to bounce off different things. I'll, I'll work on one thing for a few minutes or 10 minutes, or if I'm feeling it an hour or two, uh, and then I'll jump on something else. For me, uh, my mind's all over the place all the time. Uh, my wife kind of hates it because I'm uh, middle of a conversation. I'll just talk about something totally different, but I explained to her uh, it's the creative pro for me. It's my creative mind just working, being able to just sort of just go somewhere totally different. So look, technology has helped me work on a million projects in one day. That's what I do. I, 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 I go throw the baseball outside of my kids for a few minutes, come back in work. And that's also one of the great parts about uh, having a studio at home. It's also the bad part about having a studio at home is, as you guys saw at the beginning of the interview, my kids ran in and, you know, were trying to talk to me as they're, you know, walking out the door. So yeah. I don't know if you guys know, I've moved to Nashville a year ago, so I'm, I'm 
talking to you from Nashville right now. I yeah. kept my studio in LA, so I'm there one week a month. And by the way, in that week a month, I'm in the studio at my house in LA from eight in the morning till midnight for about five or six days straight. So I do that. I go back to that old mentality of just jamming for, for, you know, the entire day. That's not bad. I, I'm curious though, because like you said, technology changes things. It allows you to be all over the place. I remember the days when you had to load floppy disks into your MPC 60. So it kept you kind of focused on a song because you couldn't put it down and just pick it right back up. So there was something to that in the process. But now that you're able to multitask and you can be all over the place, it seems to be working for you. But in the process of producing for an artist, when you produce from the beginning, you're able to maybe wring more out of a performance from an artist and, and shape that process a little bit. On the flip side, if you're doing a remix, you don't have that artist chirping in your ear and you really get to do what you do in that in that part of the process, sort of independent. Are you saying that you don't prefer that anymore and you want to go back to collaborating with an artist in the booth? Oh, I do lots of collaborating. You know, I just did a remix. <laughs> I'll go back to remixing. I just did a remix for Sarah Bareilles, uh, a song called Fire off her new album. Which is great. Yeah. It, and then the remix is better than the original song. And well, I'm not, come on. T-Bone Burnett produced the original. It's pretty, it's not bad. It's pretty good. Yeah. It's different. It's a great song. I would never <laughs> say it's better. It's. I would always just say it's different. Never. I would never say something, my, what I do is better than the original. It's just a different interpretation. I did mine. But you should have heard the first remix. See, this, the, that was the se- the one the remix you guys have heard. It was the second remix I did for her. Mm-hmm. The first one I did in some ways is better than the one that actually came out but it was a big disco uh anthem kind of thing and she really wasn't feeling it feeling it wanted to stay truer to the original Mm. so you know i still do have to make sure the artists are happy with what i'm i'm not doing this for me i'm doing it for the artist yeah well i will say that you know t-bone's version is great it's a great song yeah, uh, but I've probably pushed the play on play button on the remix more, more than I've pushed the play button on the on the original song. Man, thanks. You know, it's funny that remix sort of turned out kind of like the first remix that I ever heard that really resonated with me by Todd Terry for everything but the girl, a song called "Missing." Oh yeah, that was terrific. Which for me what was good. like, yeah. wow. In for me was the first popular remix hmm. like that was the first a lot of people don't even know that's a remix they think that's the original version it's it's not the original version it's it, you know the remix is the one that got played on the radio yeah and it was todd terry doing a club remix he didn't change a lot you know just kind of like i did on the uh the sarah Bareilles. i mean i changed a lot but but it sounds like the original song and that's kind of what todd terry did with everything everything but the girl missing i think that was like 93 or something Huh. Well, yeah, well, that that's song the peak was, of that band right there too. That remix wow. just took such it, a great it, band. The, they were a great band to begin with, and the remix just basically introduced a lot of other people to the band who became fans immediately because of that. That's a great thing about remixes. Well, this is why people like Sting redo their music or U2 or whoever it is, the bands that are long, long established is to Take yeah. fresh and really truly in for a yeah. new audience. I'm, well, there's there's many reasons. Some most of the time people want you know club mixes for people to dance to in the clubs. Sometimes Sting just wants a new version because look, if you listen to um, well, out of the six songs on the new on the new album, uh, the one that I asked to remix, he asked me to do five, mm. and I said, I said I really love if you love somebody, set them free. Can you? Can I work on that? So he wasn't planning on even actually putting that on the new album. And he, they got me parts on that. As you, if you guys have listened to it, I, I totally, I totally flipped it. It's like, it's the new single. Uh-huh. It's the one he's performing everywhere right now. Like wow. on all the TV shows and stuff. I just do what did what I do, which is I just kind of like did what I was feeling. Like the original bass. That's on the original song is on the new, is on the new version. It's the same bass. Yes. Sting didn't play it. It was um, Daryl Jones. It was. It was. Yeah. 
it was meant to be a disco song, I think. And it's funny, it just it's just the same. Ba- if you listen to both versions, you would you wouldn't think it's the same bass. You would think somebody played the bass on my disco version right. for the disco version. But it, I, I absolutely yeah. was going to ask you about that. I'm glad that you brought it up that because I'm like, is that the same? Yeah, I, don't think that it was, is. I thought absolutely. Sting played it, and I was like, and I was like, hey, tell Sting that his bass on uh, "Set Them Free" was awesome. And they're like, no, he didn't play it. It, it wasn't him. He just re- no. He goes, oh, he just remembered it wasn't him. Yeah. And if you watch the video, I think. Uh, it's the video you can see what he wasn't playing the bass either so yeah daryl jones is in that video yeah. your thing though when you remix the first thing you do is reconstruct the drums yeah and that, usually i mean that's if yeah who doesn't i mean i don't know how you don't do that it's about well drums and sort of a kind of arranging i think i kind of mm-hmm. figure out what i want to do on the arrangement and then i just start filling in stuff i think obviously after i do drums i do bass that makes sense right okay um, and then everything else is just sort of filling in. On top but of I that. dig that you made the choice to leave the bass alone on that song. Oh my God. You're kidding me. I, I mean, look, I, I, whenever I do any kind of redo or, you know, reproduce or remix, whatever, I always try and include stuff that I think is cool from the original. I mean, when I remix U2, U2 stuff, This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner or at John LG69 at the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. Stuff that I think is cool from the original. I mean, when I remixed U2, U2 stuff, uh, I think I only did one. Did I do one song for you? Yeah. I kept everything. Magnificent. I kept the drum fills. I kept I put, I put. kept the bass in there, the guitars, because that's U2. Yeah. I, I, that was, when I did that, when I did that remix, I think I was really like, oh my God, this is U2. You know, to, I please let me not fuck this up. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I can't just mute everything and keep Bono's vocal, which is probably what most remixers would have done. And yeah. I'm saying most, like 99, percent yeah, um, would have just killed all the music and kept Sting's vocal. Uh, sorry, Bono's vocal, Bono Sting. But that's it's not you too, though, right? They come as a package deal. I mean, those guys sort the songs. It's out not in the like studio. look, some bands. It's like there's one person in the band that's great and the rest other guys are like just in the band you two for me is about four dudes that all are equally great so that's that's what i was thinking when i did the remix hey talk a little bit about sting's voice at this point in his career because that's another thing that stands out in these remixes did he sing to your track or yes did you already have oh that's terrific yeah uh except on two songs which i use the original set them free that's the original vocal brand new day original vocal wow but so i think uh, things vocal sounds better now than it did so in the good. day and i'll tell you a i'll tell you a crazy story this is the best sting vocal story ever i was working on brand new day i heard some vocals and i, I heard some weird vocals and i thought it was headphone bleed and i'm like that's just the weirdest thing it's like weird harm harmonies that i'm like are there are there harmonies i'm missing like are there tra- background tracks that he didn't use in the original that were like in his headphones and i called martin and i go man it was probably like 11 p.m. at night here or something you know and i'm like man i feel like i'm uh, i'm tripping out like i just ate some mushrooms or dropped acid or something i don't know i'm really tripping out because i'm hearing some weird things i don't know what to do can you can you help me here? And he said, "Man, they always say when Sting sings, he has a little man singing with him." And what that means is he has nodules on his vocal cords, and uh, they create like harmonies, harmonics when he's singing. That's and freaky. Wow. It's not like a straight harmony. So, in other words, if he sings a part, it's not going to sing like an automatic third. Yeah. The, the the nodules are actually just doing their own note, so it could be it doesn't it's not an it's not an exact yeah. harmony, just but it's sub just, vibration. It's another like harmony you would have never ever done in a million years because it's like depending on how he's singing, you know. 
and it really freaked me out, man. But it was awesome. I just, at this, I'm, I'm like, dude, it just made me go, man, Sting is even more awesome than I thought he was to begin with. So it's just, just cool. Just a cool moment. That is cool. And I appreciate that story because, man, I've you know been listening to Sting a lot uh, all of my life, and I've never heard that story. But I can totally relate to... You know the uh, finding some uniqueness in his voice, and th- and there's nobody better placed to do that than a producer slash remixer who's got headphones on and is really digging deep into that vocal. He's he's uh, you know, look, he's he's crazy. You know, Sting. So we did the brand new, I did the brand new day and New Year's Eve, and then like the first week of January, second week, I don't know. He goes, let's do this, let's do an album. Let's re- I want to read update all my songs. I don't know if you guys know this. He was in a play. He just he was doing a play. He was literally February, March, April. He was doing a play in Toronto, right. and every night, um, I think it's a three hour play or something. So he would get to the uh, venue and they go through makeup, hair and makeup, and then he'd go backstage. In sorry, the the play would start. He'd do a couple scenes and then he'd have like a little break. So he'd come backstage in makeup and hair and he'd throw his bass on and turn the mic on and he was singing vocals. What? He was, yeah, I have I have pictures of him doing this. They were sending me pictures. He was recording vocals for this this album uh, in between scenes. Not like not like after the play, go to the studio and record some stuff. Like like no, let's just just turn the mic on. Give me a mic back here. Give me an engineer. And so the hit record and uh, let me just do it in between scenes. Well, the, you know, there's a couple thousand, 1500 people, whatever, and outside the audience, you know, waiting for him to come back out and do another scene backstage recording yeah. vocals and playing bass. Wow. He's sending it to me. <laughs> That's like Roy Jones Jr. Defending his, his, you know, his fighters championship and then going out and playing a professional yeah, basketball it's just, game. It's afterwards. like he's a machine. <laughs> I mean, and he's, you know, I don't have to tell you guys. Everybody knows Sting's in phenomenal shape. Yeah, he doesn't he doesn't age, or he hasn't aged in a, a couple decades. He sings great. He's performing. And by the way, does he have to perform? He doesn't have to do anything. No, no. but guess what? He's no. been on he's been on tour for like three years, I think, straight. Wow. Yeah. Just a just a, yeah. he's a, he's a monster. Yeah, and I'm just very lucky to be involved in the project. You seem like you're pretty even keeled. You know, you're, you're like, holy shit, that's Sting, or holy shit, that's you too, that kind of thing. And I get all that, but you don't seem to get super stoked or or very low. I mean, you win a Grammy, like, yeah, I've got a Grammy. It's like not not that big of a deal. Is there anything that really <laughs> like makes you want to throw your fist in the oh. air, and like, oh, you know, no. it's, maybe it's your kids. I don't um, know. Um, no, what do I get excited about? You're saying, yeah. Yeah, like when you get, like I don't know, like do you pull pull the segment of the song together and just get up and like celebrate for a second, or are you just not a super? Oh my god, I think I'm a peaky guy. I just, man, I'm I I I, maybe I'm getting old. I don't know. No, I mean I just uh, I don't know. I think I just I get excited all the time, but it's um, it's just I have so many things I'm working on. It's kind of you know, it's kind of hard. People don't realize. You know, I'm not just working on a song a week or even a song a day. I'm working on so many things, and I think it makes it kind of harder to 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 sort of go crazy. I do get excited about things. I just I've like recently I've written a couple songs I'm really excited about for different diff- totally different artists, and that I do get excited. I can see like, oh, this is going to be this is going to be good. Um, sometimes I have no idea the song is going to going to be as good as it turns out to be, and that's exciting when I hear it on the radio or something. But I do get excited, guys. Yeah, I mean, I get excited <laughs> when, when my kids hit home runs at baseball, or you know, those are the those are the the great parts of life. I'm excited every day. So, man, I I I, I, I wouldn't say that I'm just uh, 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 bored with pr- producing. I think I just I, maybe I'm I'm gotten used to just coming in here and doing it every day all day. When you look forward to the music that you're going to be making. Uh, what do you see around the corner? Is there more influence coming from the rest of the world? Is there more? I mean, I know there's a ton of K-pop now. Everybody's listening to and, Is and everybody. Like are that, you guys but, listening to K-pop? Because I'm no. not. Listening to K-pop. <laughs> I mean, yeah, look at totally Pete. Into it. <laughs> yeah, no, I think K-pop's just the thing of the you know, it's the it's the 
term of the of the month or the a thing of the moment. Whatever. I look, and I'm not okay. I'm not downplaying K-pop. I'm just saying there's always in my in my world there's always been something future house, um, uh-huh. heart. You know, uh, handbag was a term years ago. There's always some little term coming along. That's just the way people like try to get other people excited about music. The new oh, it's this new thing that you haven't heard about. It's this Yoko. It's this young country sound. Or, you know, there's always something. Come on. Yeah. Remember Trap? Remember the first time you heard Trap? Right. <laughs> I mean, what's Trap? You know, it's like, or sure. Dubstep, the first time you heard yeah. Dubstep. It's like, you know, that's always going to happen. It's, it's just it's just a way of, yeah. it's and it's only a thing that's happened in the last uh, couple decades. It didn't happen. It was rock and roll for a long time, right? And there wasn't like hard rock and roll, right. soft rock and roll. It was just rock and roll. So, you know. It's just this fun thing we have going on. So does that mean that these things come by and they maybe leave a little bit of a mark, but the but the locomotive trudges on? The locomotive trudges on, man. I, you know, um, I, we're so close. I'm so close to it. I don't know how you guys feel. It's hard to tell what what our generation is going to leave musically to the next generation. Um, you know, you look back. It's obviously you see big band. You see sixties and seventies and. 80s 90s i don't even really know what 2000s is 2010s i don't even i don't even know what that is is there something i have no i don't even know if you guys know you should probably tell me because i don't think we will know for another 20 years (laughs) because i mean the 80s were just at the time it was just music yeah and it it felt the same yeah and then now we see what the mark was i think that the 2010s it's shorter Right, like kids, a lot of times don't listen to the whole song. So, a seven and a half minute minute remix oh. has to be played by somebody else for them to consume it. Otherwise, it's just totally. they're almost. It's, it's about sh- for sure. It's about short, short pieces of stuff. In fact, my songs are my my new pop productions are getting shorter. Wow, yeah. Two. We're, I just did a song. Uh, what Old Town <laughs> Road? Let's talk about the song of the song of the moment. How how long is Old Town Road? Do you guys know? It's like two something. Wow. wow. Two ten. Yeah, that's getting back to the 50s. Wow. It's like two ten. Low twos even. That's just crazy. That's short. Yeah. Uh, it's not crazy. It's it's actually awesome. You know what it is? Yeah. And it, somebody, a, a young person explained this to me. Um, because if you play, when you play Old oh. Town Road, it's so short, they're going to play it again. Terrific. That is terrific. Nice. It's so short, they're going to play it again. Yeah, if it's a long song, you're like, okay, I'm going to take a break. I've yeah. heard it. I've heard it. But if you, if you keep it short, they're yeah. going to play it again, or it's going to, you know, it's going to get looped in your however you're listening the, to it. You know, a lot yeah. of times it'll repeat it. You know, and it's genius. It's like it's like what yeah. the kid thought when he made the song. He's like, no, I want I want to keep it short, so they'll listen to it again yeah. really quick. Don't give them wow. too much. And I don't think that that was a, a playing into the Spotify model or anything like that. That was just what he was thinking. So I appreciate the purity of that thought. It's a it's a cool thought, and it's you know it's little thing little nuggets like that you get from the new yeah. the young generation that makes you go, wow, I've been doing it wrong all these years. I'm gonna no, I'm gonna start doing you know short stuff. They're right, but you know there's there's songs that should be short. By the way, that type of song should be short. Yeah, it's not like a, a super deep Titanic type yeah. song that you want to hear the whole thing, right? Yeah, big epic, sure. an yeah. opus. So before we wrap, I want to make sure I mention uh, one of our good friends of the show actually hosting or DJing uh, my uh, my girlfriend's fiftieth birthday party, which is going to be an erasure based dance party. But uh, his oh, name wow. is DJ Severe. He DJs at Dodger Stadium, <laughs> and uh, I just got to make sure I say his name because I'm sure he plays your remixes because. He's widely recognized as the best. Yeah, DJ for sure. Major league That's player. cool. Yeah, I I was him. wondering who the, the the DJ was that was doing all the major league stuff. He does it for the Dodgers. Every stadium has their own guy, but he's he's particularly good. And you know you're good when like the old reporters are complaining about how loud the <laughs> and music is. they know that's that there's a guy the playing job. music. That's the that's the that's when you know you're doing a good job. Yeah. Hey man. So last last thing I want to know is who are you looking forward to working with? Who am I looking forward to working with? Oh, man, I can't answer that question because I just, you know, I'm right now I'm looking for for young talent. Um, I just developed, I'm developing, I have three or four artists right now I'm developing. 
And for me, it's exciting finding these young kids who have super talent, but not sure what to do with it, not sure what to sing about, not sure how to do it, how to record, you know, and taking them and sort of getting them to the next stage. Um, and so I've done that. Re- I've been doing that a lot recently with with a, uh, a girl that was 14, a kid that was 19. I have another kid that's 23. So these young, talented artists uh, are really, really uh, exciting me right now. Terrific. Nam next month. Are mm. you speaking at Nam? Oh, you mean Nam uh, in Nashville. Nashville? Yeah. Right now, I'm not because a lot of the people that I work with, uh, Waves, uh, Sound Toys, Plug In Alliance, they don't come to the Nashville show. They don't. I don't know if they care about the national. You know, Nashville. They should. I think mm. they should. And maybe that would be my next phone call uh, because, you know, I think they still think Nashville is very, you know, country guitar, you know. Yeah, based. So there's a lot of guitar people here for that. It's also middle of the summer, but Nashville is the super hot place to to visit. I don't know if you guys know that. It's like the the the, the play. It's like forget Vegas. Vegas is fun. Vegas yeah. is also expensive, mm-hmm. and um, Nashville is a lot more green than Vegas is. Yeah, I just have one more thing for you, and uh, but I also want you to tell us where where it's the best place to listen to the. Uh, my songs is it spotify or whatever but um any any projects potentially coming up with me robbie and robbie williams, williams? I think you guys would be an awesome match that would be an awesome match ma- uh, yeah know, I, I love Rob. I'm, I'm a fan of robbie's I, I i i never understood why robbie really me too didn't get the love here in america i think it's just i don't know it's a shame because he's as, as you know he's ridiculously huge overseas yep. so that would He's kind of like Paul Weller, where he just maybe gets he lost likes it though, because then he can across he can have his place in Hidden Hills and and go to the go to the, go to, you know, go to Gelson's or 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 Whole Foods and not not get recognized, <laughs> you know. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then what about listening to my Man, songs? I think what's just, the best uh, place to support you? You know what's awesome? I'll tell you about my songs. The 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 way to listen to my songs is old school, dude. Buy the CD. You know why? Because there's a cool booklet in there when where Sting wrote his process on every song and how he wrote how he wrote the song oh right on so kind that's of a awesome cool, i think they made vinyl too the vinyl should be out now if you're vinyl is a big thing for a lot of people right now but it's pretty cool just to read the story of each song and, and how he wrote it okay we'll put a link on the uh, on the show so you guys everybody listening buy the cd or buy vinyl because <laughs> we're not yeah where, where else could you get link Steve and also your comment about that That's fantastic. Yeah. brings it all back to the fact that Dave Auday has a career because he's gotten the most out of a song while being true to the original composition of the song, the original idea of the song. And this is going back to the original idea of the music experience where you pop open the liner notes, you read about how the song was, was crafted. And uh, this is great, man. I'm glad you were a part of it, and I appreciate you coming on the show. Everybody, Dave Auday. Check them out. Guys, thanks for having me.